Is that yeah, I'm starting now. Like you can go whenever you're ready. Great. Okay. Thanks very much for inviting me along to this give this talk. Um, I've got some quite recent work about evolving con control architectures, which uh, I think people may find interesting and come up with some results which quite surprise me in any way. Um, so I'm going to talk about a theory of behavior based upon uh, control theory and how it can be applied to uh, simulated and real world robotic systems in sort of dynamic and unpredictable environments without the need for sort of complex computations or predictive modeling. And I'll also talk about how we can get these systems to learn for themselves through sort of self-organizing processes. And so it should be about um, 40 minutes. And yes, put questions in the chat and perhaps Frederick can keep an eye on those for me. Uh, this is my main paper about what I'm gonna be talking about, which is in the Artificial Life Journal. Uh, as Frederick mentioned, my um, studies in AI and robotics were in the 90s. Uh, but I just wanted to mention what I was doing, doing before then as a sort of relevant to the sort of directions which I took. I spent about um, 10 years going around the world as a, uh, in the, and in this case in the desert in Kuwait, um, as a land surveyor, sort of measuring angles, distances, and levels to build up three dimensional models of, of the world. And it's during this time I became interested in the human mind and living systems, and also in computers as well, because at this time I bought one of the first computers with color graphics, the Commodore Amiga. But my goal in all this has always been to sort of understand how the human mind and living systems work. And obviously computers are a fantastic tool to allow us to sort of model our theories and build artificial systems. And perhaps the person we have to thank for that is, of course, this guy, Alan Turing, the father of computer science. Uh, so on his uh, research and work on computation and universal Turing machines, he sort of laid foundations for computer science. And of course, he's also very famous for his code-breaking work during the Second World War at Bletchley Park. Now, when I got to university, I found that a lot of the AI approaches are about top-down, sort of high-level cognitive abilities such as logic and reasoning, knowledge representation, symbol manipulation, problem solving, and natural language processing. Uh, those approaches that sort of did have some involvement with the real world, such as David Marr's sort of vision processing pipeline, were very much about sort of input-output processes of extracting information from the, the world or from the images in order to build three-dimensional models which may late, later be used for robots to navigate around. And this was very much like what I had been doing as a land surveyor. So I didn't really buy that this was something that we did naturally. Now, although these um, techniques and approaches were sort of technically very clever, I didn't really feel they had very much to do with how living systems work. And particularly this sort of one-way static passive process of transforming inputs to models. It seemed to have little consideration for the role of action and the dynamic nature of the environment. There were some more interesting approaches at the times, Gibson's ecological perception and artificial life, which was more sort of bottom-up approach, but they still seem to be about extracting information or a subsumption architecture of the same input output processes. So when I went on to do my PhD, I was thinking about visual attention because it seemed to combine both perception and action. But I didn't seem to get very far. Then one day in the supermarket, I, I had an epiphany. And I was thinking about when you're in an art gallery and you're looking at a, a picture and you can't make out what it is. So you might sort of move a bit closer or you move a bit of, move further away and suddenly it will come into view. You sort of recognize or perceive what it actually is. So that, le that left me feeling that action and movement was in the service of perception rather than action being derived from perception. 
So I didn't really know where to go with that straight away. But soon after I came across this book, Behavior the Control of Perception. <clears throat> and this seemed to sort of lay out for me an almost entire theory of what I'd had a very small inkling of. This is a way of thinking about behavior as a sort of dynamic, tightly coupled interaction between perception, action, and the environment. And it's based on simple principles that seem sort of evolutionary plausible. It had the potential to explain complex behavior. And it covers perceptual control theory, as it's called, it covers sort of many dis disciplines within the life sciences, psychology, biology, animal behavior, sociology, and AI and robotics. <clears throat> and these are just some of the people who are working on it now or uh, recently. And uh, this robot down the bottom is one of the most recent robotic implementations, which is by Henry Yin, so from a neurobiology uh, perspective. So it's PCT, perceptual control theory, I'm going to be talking about today and how it can be applied to robotic systems. So basically, perceptual control means that the purpose of behavior is to keep what we perceive at desired values. And action is very dynamically in order to maintain those perceptions. Uh, so here are some examples in terms of behavior. So the iris system in the eye opens and closes in order, in order to maintain a constant desired amount of light on the retina. We can control, perceive and control the visual relationship between a hand, our hand and an object when we want to pick something up. When we're speaking face to face with someone, we control the distance between us at a level which is comfortable to us. And different people will have a different idea of what is comfortable to them. And at different times, that value will be different, such as during a, a pandemic. We can perceive a controlled sequence of things, such as the letters in a word or the toppings on a pizza, for example. We can perceive and control things that happen over extended periods of time, events, such as writing a sentence, catching a train, or giving a presentation. At an even higher level, we can perceive and control more abstract things. So we might control the sense of honesty by robbing or not robbing a bank. And by voting in an election, we are, to some degree, controlling a concept of a sort of desired political system. So in terms of uh, computation for modeling purposes, uh, we come up with a sort of basic unit of sort of four simple functions and values. So we have a sort of internal reference value, which is the goal of that unit, the perception, which is the sort of current view of the environment, the comparator, which gives the sort of error difference between those two, uh, then the output, which is a function of the error and provides the action that is applied to the environment. So we end up with a uh, control unit where the action varies dynamically, um, affecting the perception via the environment in order to keep the perception in line with the reference value while resisting environmental disturbances. So the actual computations are pretty simple. So typically for the reference or the perception, they will be a function of the inputs and just typically weighted, weighted sums. And on the output side, that would be a leaky integrator. In other words, a sort of exponential smoothing function. So you can think of it as similar to a sort of PID controller, but with a PCT framework around it. Now, the real power of this approach comes not just from the single units, but how they are arranged in a hierarchy. So the system is con uh, controlling multiple variables at the same time, and those variables are more complex and abstract as you go up the hierarchy. So going up, a perception at each level is a combination of uh, perceptual signals from below the levels below. And coming down the hierarchy, a reference at each unit is a combination of outputs from the higher level units. But they're not uh, specifying what 
they're not specifying commands on what this unit should do, but they're specifying what that unit should perceive. Uh, and then that unit would actually would vary its outputs in order to achieve its own goal. So nowhere are actions being sort of selected or specified. It's only at the interface with the with the environment where actions actually happen, and even there they're sort of dynamic uh, according to needs. So we can get this uh, complexity arising out of these simple principles and simple modules. And there's also, I think, a significant difference with conventional neural networks in terms of uh, um, explainability. It's much more transparent what is going on in a perceptual control network. So we can sort of examine each individual unit or node and establish what goal it's trying to achieve and how it is doing it. Another great insight is that uh, perceptual control is the basis uh, of all types and levels of behavior. And this just, just is a rough indication of the different types of perceptions that might be controlled at different levels. So at the lower levels, you'd have more simple perceptions like the intensity of sound, which you might control by uh, turning a volume knob. In the middle, you have relationships between things such as the book is on the table, and at the top, more ab abstract things like political systems and religious ideologies. We view them all as uh, perceptions. So here's an example from experimental psychology, and this could potentially inform a robotics implementation. And it's a, a simulation of what might typically be seen as requiring predictive modeling uh, text catching a baseball. So it might be thought that you need to compute or determine the trajectory of the ball in order to predict the position you need to run to, uh, to catch the ball. So this is uh, showing the path of the baseball and the path of fielder on, on the left hand side here. And sometimes you see that the fielder runs in the wrong direction initially. Uh, and that is what happens in real life. And on the right, we're seeing the um, running rate and the trajectory of the ball from the field's point of view. And these are consistent with real observations. But this is achieved uh, simply by controlling the vertical and horizontal, horizontal optical velocities of the image of the ball on the retina from the field's point of view. So the result is you're sort of both matching the pace of the ball and are underneath it as well. There's no um, predictive modeling or of the dynamics uh, of the ball. And there's no sort of memory of muscle commands as some people have claimed. And this same scheme can be shown to work with things like Frisbees and model helicopters, which don't follow uh, as predictable course as a baseball does. So that's a very brief overview of, of the approach. And I think it's very different from the um, sort of standard computational approach. Um, and I don't mean to sort of reject computation entirely, of course, because there's computations within a, a the, for modeling a PCT system. But what I mean here is approaches that view behavior as a sort of process of linear causation of mapping inputs to outputs, uh, usually requiring sort of big data or complex computational models. So I think even these sort of modern AI systems follow, uh, they follow an approach that I sort of rejected sort of 25 years ago. And they're doing the same thing in the same way, but they might be more sophisticated due to having more processing power. So with these sort of reinforcement learning, that sort of mapping states to actions, uh, neural networks is mapping inputs to outputs. Uh, natural language processing sort of analyzes queries based on big data models to sort of generate responses. Autonomous vehicles process information to locate themselves in a 3D world uh, for navigation. 
robots in factories uh, require sort of precision engineering and controlled environments to sort of execute pre-planned movements within a 3D framework. And SLAM is sort of the modern equivalent of the blocks world approach, which is fine if you want to sort of build a, um, an automated surveying machine. Uh, but I think it's has little, these have little to do with how living systems work. And th this approach is often encapsulated, I think, by this sort of sense, think, act pipeline, which represents a sort of open loop way of thinking. Now, although the diagrams may sort of include this sort of backwards arrow, I think that, you know, it's a sort of suggesting a sort of uh, control loop. I think it's really just sort of repeating same open loop process. And certainly not the sort of um, dynamic, continuous, negative feedback, closed loop control process that I've been talking about, where um, variables are maintained at doll values. So I think this computational approach has sort of taken us away from understanding how living systems work. And modern AI is based on failed metaphors of information processing and the mind as a computer. And the person we have to thank for that is this guy, Alan Turing, who I call the Grim Reaper of artificial intelligence. Um, with his work on computer and intelligence, I think he sort of laid the foundations of seven decades of AI research, but in the in the wrong direction. And I think there's been sort of little progress on understanding the fundamental nature of behavior and intelligence. And, and reading his paper here, you can see he had some strange ideas of uh, understanding how the mind worked. And they were sort of based on sort of wacky, unsubstantiated, uh, unscientific theories, which had been sort of roundly discredited. And, and he also believed in telepathy. Now, I'm probably being a bit unfair on Alan himself. It was also due to the AI pioneers at the Dartmouth conference in 1956, where they sort of laid down the concepts of uh, and research directions of AI, which they sort of would define then and sort of been followed ever since. Okay, so to get back to um, living systems and the applications of perceptual control, I just go through some examples of perceptual control theories applied to robotic systems. So if we take the example of this classical control problem of uh, balancing the inverted pendulum on the, so the cart pole problem, and think about it, how it would be implemented in terms of uh, perceptual control. So from the top, we would have a system, a unit for uh, controlling the pole angle uh, to keep it balanced at zero. And that unit would achieve its goal by setting a reference for the, the a level below, which will control the pole velocity. And that system will control its velocity by controlling the cart position, which would control its position by controlling the cart velocity, which in turn would uh, control its velocity by uh, uh, varying the force applied to the environment. <clears throat> so the result would be this what we see in this video here of the, uh, the car pole being balanced. And, and in this situation, in this approach, there's no mapping of, of uh, states to actions. Now, because it's a sort of highly modular system, we can think about adding other control units to this hierarchy, um, perhaps at a higher level, uh, to allow the system to control different variables which would result in, in different behavior. So we can think of a, adding a level to the top of this which would control the pole position. And by that I mean the, the, the tip of the pole itself. And that unit would achieve its goal by varying the pole angle. So uh, tipping the pole angle to the left or right would be the result and all the way down the hierarchy. And so the result would be uh, what we see here, a system that can move, move the, the whole um, cart pole around. So it's 
at the top level, it's changing the goal of the pole position and it propagates all the way down the hierarchy, resulting in the whole system moving around. <clears throat> but of course, more interesting is applying it to um, systems that work in the, in the real world. Um, and this is the example here. And this has uh, something extra actually in that it is able to autonomously stand up as well. And the standing up is, is interesting because the, the force applied is um, non-linear, but it's generated on the fly, not by uh, a model. And as it's not by a model, you could change physical parameters such as adding weights to the system and it would still stand up in the same way. But this, this is working on a sort of shaky high speed train. And so it's easily able to handle multiple disturbances. Now, although I'm removing it, I'm, I'm moving it remotely uh, and turning it around remotely. Uh, but apart from that, it's sort of standing up and balancing autonomously. Uh, and then in the end, I sort of trigger it to, to sit down again. Here's an example of a PCT hierarchy applied to a Baxter robot arm. And in this case, it's doing Tai Chi movements. So this is a, a four level hierarchy where at the top level, you just define a, a sequence of goals for the um, three dimensional positions you want the end effectors to be in. Then the whole system moves dynamically without any computation in advance. And you could do things like add weight to it, add weights to it, and it would, it would compensate for those weight disturbances. You can also um, cut connections within its network and it would find um, other routes to achieve the goal, other routes through the network. This is the uh, part of the architecture for that system where each triangle here is a, uh, a single unit. And um, so at the top level there, we see units for controlling the, the arm reach and the hand control. And they, they each set goals for the lower level units which control the, uh, the joint angles or joint position. So with the memory of these high level goals of the 3D positions, the system moves continuously and dynamically adjusting position in many dimensions uh, to reduce the error within each unit and in turn the error within the whole network. So there's no uh, kinematics computations or trajectory planning. So the system is very uh, computationally lightweight. Here's a similar example with the the Baxter arm again, in this case, following uh, the green ball. And in this case, there's no 3D coordinates at all. So it's controlling the visual relationship between the arm and an object, this object. Um, in this case, there's a camera in the hand of the, the robot there, which is using, the, which is the vision system. So as you can see, the whole arm is moving each individual joints are moving independently and at different rates. So each of them are controlling their own perceptions in real time. So it's a similar architecture to the, the previous one, except the perceptual variables are from vision rather than 3D coordinates. Here's a hierarchy applied to this uh, environment for avoiding obstacles. So this is this hierarchy is controlling multiple variables at the same time, such as proximity to objects, uh, compass direction, and speed. So the result is a system that sort of avoids obstacles and reaches the target, which in this case is the 
the red line. <clears throat> uh, it can also be applied to sort of a simulated autonomous vehicle. So if you keep your eye on the, the blue vehicle here, which is the one controlled by perceptual control. So that's controlling the, uh, and maintaining perceptual relationships between um, itself and other vehicles, uh, and also the road itself, such as the lane uh, control. So from that emerges this behavior of this, the car sort of following, overtaking, and generally sort of weaving in and out of the traffic. And this is achieved without any predictive modeling. So it's not necessary to compute the future traje trajectories of other vehicles, for example. Okay. Uh, were there any questions before I went on to the next section? Uh, yeah, there was one question about uh, the robot raising arm from Gary that was asking if you cut the connection in the in that robot, if he will start to reorganize the connection to achieve the top level goals. Um, <clears throat> in this case, there was no there was no sort of reorganization. I think it's more in this case that. Um, some of the routes through the network are sort of redundant. So it might sort of increase its um, output to through one route uh, rather than the one it would have done in the first place. So it's just uh, automatically finding other ways to um, achieve its goal by going through, by um, applying more output to a different route through the network. Okay, um, so the problem with those systems that we've been looking at is that they've been sort of manually designed, created, and tuned. And that can be pretty laborious and take quite a long time. So recently I've been looking at trying to get the systems to self-organize. Self so to learn the hierarchy and the parameters for themselves. But just to say a bit about learning and adaptation. This is the way I think about it within PCT from um, simple abilities to more complex. So initially you'd have sort of basic control where um, the, the output you have in the system is proportional uh, proportional to the error. So for example, when, when you're controlling uh, position by velocity, then integral adaptation where you might have a non-zero output, even though the error is zero, such as when you're standing up. Uh, now those first two aren't sort of really changing uh, the parameters or the structure within the system. So what we might not regard those as learning, but the other ones I'm gonna mention uh, are learning because they're changing the internal structure. So you might have sort of basic something like auto tuning of a gain or weights to improve the performance of a system, uh, more extensive reorganization of the sort of networks and connections and the, or, or the structure, so the connections and weights. And this, this might include forming new perceptual functions uh, to view the environment in, in a new way. Memory in PCT we can think of being stored values of perceptions which enables you to control without first having to learn from scratch every time. Um, imagination allows you to sort of run through control scenarios in your mind to come up with what might be the best solution when applied uh, to the real world. And then consciousness perhaps is about um, directing reorganization to specific areas to either improve what you're doing or acquire new skills. Um, so there's two aspects I've been looking at for, for getting the robotic, robotic systems to sort of learn for themselves. The first is to come up with a sort of initial structure. And for that, I'm looking at um, evolutionary algorithms, genetic algorithms, which will sort of generate and evaluate 
perceptual control hierarchies. And the other side, the other aspect is to deal with uh, lifetime learning, so the ability to adapt to a world which is changing. And for that, I'm looking at a process similar to deep learning, though tailored for feedback control systems, which would sort of reorganize the structure and parameters of the system um, according to the overall error within the system. But today, I'm just going to be talking about the first one, the evolutionary algorithms. And so we return to the, the cart poll for this. So we just give the genetic, genetic algorithm the environment, uh, which in this case comes from the open AI gym um, suite, which is, is used for reinforcement learning, but I'm using it for control. So we give it the inputs uh, and the action space. Uh, then we also give it the, the sort of reference goal, which in this case for the part board is zero. Uh, but we don't tell the algorithm which of these inputs we want to be zero. So the algorithm generates lots of hierarchies, evaluates them, and then uh, eventually converges on a successful structure. And so now we're going to see the, uh, the best individual from each generation. And this is evolving over 10 generations with 100, a population of 100 each generation. So as we can see there, uh, it succeeded after the sort of third generation and then improved a bit over the subsequent generations. And this is the uh, architecture that the genetic algorithm filled in in the middle. So just to explain the color coding here, the, uh, the blue, red, amber, and green represent the four functions within one unit. So this is actually a hierarchy of three units at two levels. And you can see that the perceptions are functions of the inputs from the lower level. Uh, in this case, there's weighted sums. Now I ran this algorithm a number of times uh, with, different, with different starting uh, seeds and it came up with an even simpler architecture. So here is one which it succeeds in balancing the cart pole, but only has one control unit and it's actually only got one output gain in the system that still um, balances the cart pole. And here it's actually using as its input uh, a perceptual function, which is a combination of um, all the inputs. So actually it's only three of them because as you can see, one of the weights is ended up with is zero. So I think this has come up with a, an even simpler so solution that has been designed by humans as far as I'm aware anyway. Now, if we compare this with a system that has been developed by reinforcement learning, and in this demo, I'm adding a disturbance, which we'll see at the bottom. And for this, I'm actually changing the value of gravity within the environment, starting off at 10 meters per second, so 1G and going up to about uh, 10G. So as you can see, the the reinforcement learning one is a bit unstable to start off with anyway. Then it runs into big trouble about three or four G. Whereas the PCT controller uh, continues on to about, about eight G. <clears throat> So if we compare the, the details of these two approaches, now both were sort of trained um, over runs of the environment or 500 steps for each run. The PCT controller came up with uh, about a dozen nodes, um, about 10 weights and took a couple of minutes to train. The reinforcement learning algorithm on the other hand, had about 800 nodes, 150,000 weights and took about seven hours to train. So quite a difference between the two. Now I've been looking at some of the other environments that, in the open AI gym. Um, here's a quick one 
this is a, another a pendulum where the goal is to get it to stand up straight, but the actuator doesn't have enough power to uh, go straight up. So it has to swing back and forward first. And then this, so this is a PCT controller, which gets it to stand up. The more interesting environment, I think, is the mountain car problem. And here the goal is for the car to reach the flag at the top of the mountain, but the car doesn't have enough power to drive straight up the mountain. So initially, it has to move away from the goal first. So uh, here it is um, evolving. So initially, it doesn't go very far. Then it's doing a number of sweeps either side, eventually makes it to the top. But then it just goes to the left hand side once. Then it starts reducing how far it goes to the left hand side until eventually it just waits, it makes one small movement to the left so that it just makes it to the top of the mountain. And so again, that sort of um, succeeded in achieving its goal after three or four generations, and then it improved the performance or improved control over the subsequent generations. And here is the architecture that it, that it evolved. Um, again, it is sort of uh, two levels with a position controller at the top and two velocity controllers. Uh, in this case, the inputs to the system are the velocity of the car and the position of the car. Um, but I think let's look a bit closer at this area, because I think this is a good example of the explainability of the perceptual control network that I don't think you would get with the, a neural network. So for that area, if we just look at the output part of the two velocity controllers. Now, these are two uh, leaky integrators with different smoothing factors uh, and where the smoothing factor is between zero and one. So in this case, we have um, a factor which is almost one. So that means very smooth. In this case, it's 0.4, so uh, not so smooth. So in other words, one is responding um, slowly and one is responding faster. And uh, these are the out outputs you get from these two systems here. Now also note that the, when applied to the actual action, um, the, the weight of the fast responder is negative and small, whereas the slow responder, the weight is uh, positive and large. Um, so when they're combined, you get an initial negative movement, so initial movement to the left, uh, and then subsequently the system moves to the right where it's all positive until the goal is, is achieved. So I think this we can look at the perceptual control neural network and understand very well what it is doing and why it is doing it. Okay, that, so there were some just initial demonstrations, some very recent work for self-organizing hierarchical adaptive control systems. Uh, so next I hope to look at more complex environments such as, as walking robots. Okay, so I've talked about a way of thinking about behavior and intelligence that is in contrast to conventional approaches. The brain is not a computer or an information processing system. Living systems don't need complex computational models. So I think the fundamental functional architecture of the nervous system is signal control, and in particular, the control of perceptual inputs. And the complexity we see in behavior arises from these hierarchies of simple modules. As this is a generalized approach, it can be applied to many different types of robotic and artificial systems. And as they're highly adaptive, are suitable for real world dynamic and unpredictable environments.
we can get the systems to sort of learn for themselves and adapt their structures to the environment. And I think this has the potential to significantly speed up the development of robotic systems for sort of complex real world scenarios. Okay, there we go. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rupert. Um, so there was a question earlier uh, from Steve um, that was it seems that would be good for discussion. Uh, he was asking, uh, with this kind of hierarchical control, the locus of controls seems to be very much top down, but it seems to be no guidance for deciding what is worth doing and controlling. Motivation in living systems arise from or is learned from the bottom up, isn't it? Uh, something seems to be missing from this approach to intelligence. Um, well, I think we look at look at each of these units as they're they're each controlling their own their own sort of goals at different levels. I think when it comes to um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, it is sort of top down in, in a sense that the yeah, I mean, it does say that the goals come sort of uh, are sort of internal, um, but the goals are sort of hierarchical, so they they propagate down down the level. So each of the levels are controlling their own variables. Um, so motivation, you say arises from, learn from the bottom up. Uh, let me uh, just paraphrase the question a little bit. Okay. Uh, I suppose you could say that the, the motivation is built in and genetic. It's just part of the architecture of the system. Or, or you can say that uh, there's different levels of motivation that have to be learned somewhere along the way in the interest of homeostasis or something. Yeah. Uh, do you, does your model account for that? Well, I think if I understand you correctly, I think that's where reor reorganization would come in, in that if the system is in constant error, then it would sort of reorganize the, the hierarchy of the network. Um, and perhaps part of that, as I mentioned, sort of forming new perceptual functions. So viewing the environment in a new way so in, in that sort of sense, the, the the environment has some sort of bottom up influence on on the system. Um, so the the system would sort of reorganize. So the behavior would behavior of the system would change as well to to adapt to the the changes in the environment. So in in that way, um, I wouldn't say that motivation comes from the bottom up that your uh, way of acting in the world changes based on on the environment so i don't know whether that answers your question or not so warren you want to add something um if that's if that's okay um if that's okay rupert i yeah, guess sure. i guess just to remind us i think that pct actually fits with the basic psychology of this that intrinsic motivation is is by far the most um, effective form of motivation rather than extrinsic and in and pct the learning of that perceptual hierarchy is based on an intrinsic control system which is detecting some kind of um, uh, errors in some some prepared physiological variables you know such as uh, pain and body temperature, for example, um, and the the hierarchy that Rupert's describing in humans, it's proposed, develops in infancy, level by level. So yes, it operates in a top-down way, but it develops in the first two years of life in a in a layer by layer way, and that makes a lot of sense. And I know Ben's at this talk; he's he's also kind of made that argument around why the, the, the levels develop in the way they do. So I think it does square the question that Steve's asking. I, was, I know you know this stuff, Rupert, but I just thought bringing the developmental angle might help. Absolutely, that's great. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, I have a question. Am I coming through? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think of self-driving cars and landing space ships on Mars and this kind of stuff and uh, and how PCT could be used for that. Uh, but I'm sort of more interested in Elon Musk with respect to his fear of artificial intelligence, saying that this provides some more existential threat to us than nuclear weapons, because in 2025 or 2030, it'll be so much more smarter than we have. I never considered that seriously, but now you got me worried, Rupert. If, if you're going to have systems that can self-evolve and perhaps develop higher level goals when they get the idea that they want to take over the world, wow. I mean, have you thought of that? Is that a real threat? I think it's a long way off. Maybe 500 years, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It, yeah, I mean, it certainly is a uh, something we need to think about. Um, but I, I, it seems it seems a long way off to worry about. To be honest. We, yeah, because the the systems we have at the moment are so basic. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's no reason why they should want to take over the world. I don't think anyway. Yeah, I mean, what would those top level goals be? It's you got to stay in control of those. But anyway, it's just uh, very interesting what you're doing. I love the evolutionary aspect of coming up with uh, new systems like that in comparison with the uh, other approaches that are used. So very, very, very interesting. Good stuff. Uh, there's another question from Stefan Pate. Um, when you learn hierarchies of the control units, do you input sensors and actuator at the start of the process or do these uh, also fall out uh, of the algorithm? Uh, no, in this case, so I'm using um, certain environments uh, which supply the, uh, the input sensors or the inputs from simulated sensors and um, they provide the actuators as well. So they provide the input space and the, the output space, the action space. Um, so no, I, I don't, they, they don't come out of the algorithm. Anyway, okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, in your uh, like uh, hierarchical architectures, like the, did you explore like more distributed uh, systems? Because it seems like in your uh, your system, like that, that they might be very fragile. The the reference point, like at the top, you're okay. This one get corrupt for some reasons, or like uh, that seems to be uh, very uh, um, yeah fragile in a way, like from a architecture point of view. But what if that those kind of reference points might be like distributed, not just like fixed for like a given module, but maybe there might be some overlap of uh, those things together? Uh, well, I think generally, I mean, this, this sort of approach is highly um, distributable because all, all of the sort of units are sort of independent, really, um, although they're sort of connected. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're talking about sort of distributing on different hardware, for example, um, yeah, there shouldn't be any problem with doing, doing that. Um, and also duplicating them so you'd have redundancies as well. That should be should be fairly straightforward. Any other question from uh, someone or? Hi, Rupert. Can I just ask, were there any constraints to the genetic algorithms when you started with them, or did you literally allow any node to combine with any node in the kind of starting point? 
Um, so the sort of configuration, I guess, was there, there was sort of, I gave it a sort of maximum number of um, levels and a maximum number of nodes within each level. Um, the connections between them were sort of constrained from um, one level to the next. Uh, so uh, it wouldn't, the connections wouldn't be over to sort of two levels, for example. Um, <clears throat> but the, the connections within, between those two levels were sort of dense connections. So every node in one level would be connected to every node in the level below in that way. So there, there were some, some constraints in, in the sort of what we would understand as a, as a hierarchy in perceptual control. So we have time for one more questions. There was a note by Ben Hawker in the chat, which uh, I find intriguing. Uh, I missed that. Well, let me read it. Um, are you reading it? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, Ben has been producing um, hierarchies. Um, well, ben, why did you tell us about it? Uh, yeah, of course. So I've been studying the derivation of hierarchies um, using developmental control um, inspired by PCT and the approaches there. So looking at how the hierarchies are made, and I made an algorithm for automatically deriving hierarchies. So the slightly different variant, which is where I'm really interested in seeing what Rupert's doing, is that um, Rupert uses an algorithm that takes all of it together and produces um, the single hierarchy. Um, my approach is a little bit more um, the AI deriving what the first level or the lowest level should be learning those and then from there going right well now we've learned to control these things what other perceptions we have in our suite are we going to be able to control so and I was able to prove that actually um, when you actually derive a hierarchy progressively and optimize it progressively it's a lot less computationally difficult because obviously if you have 20 hierarchical nodes in a uh, in a control hierarchy you may be balancing 20 gains and then 20 extra parameters and this tends to be the uh, how one would say the big data approach but actually um it is possible to hugely crunch down that space by going up the hierarchy and you can actually balance things learning each level and its skills going up uh, and that actually um when tested on an unseen problem resulted in the, um, the AI that was trained developmentally doing a lot better. So it generalized a lot better to an unseen problem. So it shows that actually the approach of deriving hierarchies um, from perceptual uh, nodes is actually, um, it can be very reliable and done in a way that minimizes complexity. Sounds great. All right, so I think we're going to close down for today. So thanks again, Rupert. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, just make sure to get his email. Yes, thank, thank you. Much. And uh, yeah, we'll see you for those of you that can make it uh, in two weeks. We'll have a talk from two students uh, at UCSD from uh, Henry's lab. All right, take care, everyone. Um, I'll see Thanks you in two weeks for like those of you that can make it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you again, Rupert. Cheers.